The Wave Watch, made possible in part by Ocean Pacific. Watching Wave Watch, California's surfing show. Brought to you by John Bass and hosted by former world champion surfer Peter Townend. We invite you to watch the sport of surfing at its finest. This is Wave Watch. Hi, I'm Peter Town and welcome to Wave Watch. We've got a special show for you today. It's all the way from Hawaii. I'm actually here with Mark, who's always on the show bringing us great things. And we've got a special guest commentator today, Hans Heidemann. And we're going to be talking to a whole lot of different uh, Hawaiian surfers that these guys have interviewed. Welcome to the show, guys. We're great. It's good to be here. <laughs> Wouldn't be anywhere else. <laughs> and to start off the show, as usual, we're going to go and look at some great North Shore action, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned to Wave Watch for some rad bots. With us today is one of Hawaii's most successful and respected pros in the 1980s, Mr. Tony Moniz. Where did you start surfing? How long have you been surfing now? How did you get into the pro scene? Well, I started off, I grew up in the South Shore in Honolulu and slowly worked my way through and Surfing just became a big part of my life, kind of made it my career, and just took it one step at a time. Yeah, I know in your younger days you were involved with amateur boxing, you raced motocross. Did um, you incorporate things that you learned from those sports into your surfing? Well, for motorcycles, it takes a lot of balance, so I would say, you know, the balance factor, I can relate that towards surfing. A lot of uh, different body English movement, and uh, for, for boxing, just the dedication of training hard and, and dedicating yourself to that type of sport, it really in, build my self-confidence up of wanting to do good in competition and, and training harder than the next surfer. Because most surfers nowadays tend to just only surf. And the way competition is going now, I think we need to take it a bit further than just only surfing. So I try to build myself physically and mentally. Now that you're no longer on the tour, uh, you, you know, you're still heavily involved pro surfing. I know that's, that's one of your main responsibilities to your sponsors is, is to surf. What do you see, you know, you right now you're working with a lot of the young kids. Do you see a, we have a pretty deep talent pool of them? For the amount of surfers we have on the islands, there's a lot of good talent for the amount of surfers. Compared to places that I've been, like Australia and California, you know, you might go down to the beach and you see more kooks than hot surfers, but there is good talent, yeah. obviously, in California and Australia. There's a lot of good surfers, but there's that many surfers in the water, so you wonder, you know, where's all these hot guys coming from? So what's next for Tony Muniz? You still got goals remaining? Do you still plan to compete? I still want to compete in Hawaii. I'm concentrating on here mostly on the North Shore. At least another five years in competition, I'll try to push it to as far as I can. When it comes down to competition, you can't be a nice guy. How do you, how do you make that transition from be, being still well-liked and still being a, you know, a successful competitor? Because it's sort of hard, hard, hard thing to combine, you know? During a competition time, I just take it really serious. Because once I'm in the water, the next guy that's sitting next to me isn't my friend during that time. And out of the water, I just try to build my image up by being a nice guy. I think it pays off and it takes you a long way by building a really good image. And it's hard to build that image and it's easy to uh, you know, be out, go out there and be just a fool. So I just want to be a good guy and try to help the, the sport of surfing. And right on, Tony. Share my experience with a lot of the younger kids as much as I can. Right. Well, I mean, uh, Tony Moniz is a good guy to know if you're a kid, good guy to surf with. Great guy to be around unless you're in the heat with him. Then you don't want to know Tony Minis too well. Okay, thanks a lot, PT. Back to you. 
Each day by the sea, head night on TV, here's Wave Watch for me. Watch, watch, watch. Wave Watch. <laughs> Whenever you're in Hawaii, you want to watch, you want to surfboard, you want to wet it, you want to get some cars, whatever you want, come see my little surf buddies. It'd fix you right up. Yeah! Oh, yeah. In more ways than one. <laughs>Hans, what's, what's so special about Hawaii and Hawaiian surfing to you? You've grown up here since you are a little kid. What's it really mean to you, though, to, to surf in Hawaii? Well, it's home sweet home for me. It's, uh, it's the ultimate. It's paradise for me. I travel around the world and I you know, put on wetsuits. I come home, I just put on my surf fetish shorts and I just hang around in the 80, 80 degrees uh, temperature out in the water and out of the water. And since it's an island out here, we've got waves all around the island. We've got onshore waves to go and surf. That's always a wave. You can surf every day here. Unlike continents like in Australia and California where it might blow onshore or offshore. And uh, we've got small surf, big surf. I just enjoy coming out here and getting a wave by myself or going out to the North Shore in the wintertime and just get, you know, incredible barrels. You know, the Heidemann family is one of the oldest families in Hawaii. How much is tradition a part of the lifestyle? Well, it's Hedeman, Peter. <laughs> I've always got it wrong, man. <laughs> You've always got it wrong. It's, uh, well, my great-grandfather came as an engineer and um, over working on sugarcane. And uh, he's a photographer as well, and he took a lot of old uh, photos. And right now, the Bishop Museum, we're writing a book on it. And uh, generation by generation, I'm the you know, third, fourth generation here. So it's just traditionally, we've uh, my grandfather, my aunts and uncles and father, they've always uh, been surfing over Waikiki and with a long 12-foot redwood board, thick old boards and stuff. And it's always, water is, sports has always been in the family. And I've, uh, as soon as I rode my first wave, I've uh, loved the sport and haven't put it down since. <laughs> Let's go and watch a wave of Hans right now doing what he loves best. guest for you today, one of the most exciting surfers in the water, Johnny Boy Gomes. <laughs> How's it going, Johnny? All right, thanks, man. Where'd you surf this morning? Surfed uh, Log Cabins. Right out here? Yes. So you're living right here at Log Cabins nowadays? Yes. Okay, so you, you didn't grow up on the North Shore. I mean, everybody knows you as being a North Shore surfer now. Uh, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up on the west side of Oahu, called Macaw, and um, it's, you know, I wouldn't trade anything in a road for my roots, because I think that's what made me become what I am today, is my background, and, um, I just thank God for that. You yeah, know? you used to, I remember you used to come over a lot of times with uh, Bird Mahalona. Yes. Did he, was he uh, like a, a mentor for you? Or like uh, he was a big inspiration for me. And, um, you know, we had our up and downs and I spent a lot of time with him and he helped me out a lot. And um, like I said, he was a big inspiration. Okay, you moved away from your roots in the west side and you've been living out here in the North Shore the last few years. Why did you move over here? Basically because um, I did want to make it in the surfing road and um, Put in a simple way, if you want to make it a movie business, you got to go where it's happening. In other words, in a surfing world, this is where it's happening. North Shore is the spot in the whole world. If you want to make it, this is the place to come. What are some of Johnny Boys Gomes' goals? Do you still plan to compete? Do you want to go on the world tour? My game plan is to compete here in Hawaii because it's my advantage. And uh -huh. um, I travel during the summer, go to Bali or Fiji and do some films or steal shots because it's my advantage to um, surf big waves and I think I can compete better at big waves and I do in little waves. I think I'll lose money going on the tour. <laughs> Can your approach on the water is just totally attack when every wave you go on you attack. What's going through the head of yours? Oh uh, Mark, I don't know man. I don't even know if I have a brain. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anyways, um, I just go out there and try to surf as hard as I can. Like any sports guy, you know, he's trying to go out there and try to do the best if he can in his own sport. And um, that's my sport surfing and I try to be the best at that. Okay, what about um, Life's a Beach? I know they really sort of, they have this, uh, what's their image, their bad boy image, and I guess <laughs> that's part of your image? No, I'm a bad boy in a good way. <laughs> um, it's just a, a name, you know, nothing, I'm not trying to live up to that image or nothing, it's just, I'm naturally bad. <laughs> Man, I'm okay, so, okay, you mentioned to me before, I remember one time you told me, uh, 
you're always gonna be Johnny Boy no matter what. You're gonna be Johnny Boy Gomes. So <laughs> you, 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 you're, you're, I don't know, Mark. You wrote Johnny old. Man one time. That's because you say you're a man now. Yeah, at least I like to think so. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Johnny. That's um, Johnny Boy Gomes. Hi, I'm Buzzy Kerbox. And Wave Watch is great. <laughs> yeah! <laughs>
34 boards. I know I've seen a couple of uh, Mark Richards and Tom Currents and a uh, number of different labels on there. I'm, at, at this moment, I'm trying to get John Dom to flush 16 boards out and leave eight there at one time. I'm trying to convince him that you don't need 16. Eight will suffice per day. We haven't finished the tour off in Hawaii in, in a number of years since the IPS days, so this will be the first year for the ASP days that we're going to finish it off with the Triple Crown right here at the end of December. And I think it will be interesting to see as we get into the Hawaii winter season for 88 whether or not the guys that are good at both ends of the spectrum are able to push through from what they've done in the small wave season around the world, walk into Hawaii, get into stuff that's over eight feet, and do just as well as they were doing in stuff under four feet, or if it's going to be a couple of the guys that, uh, let's say, are just more adept at surf in Hawaii, whether or not the points will almost be thrown away in that re regard. Exactly. In a lot of cases, they do throw away those points. Well, thank you very much, Bernie Baker. It's, uh, it's a pleasure having you on the show, and we'll look forward to seeing you out this winter. Thank you. Can I say hi to Mom and Dad? Hi, Mom and Dad. Hi, I'm Buzzy Kerbox, and Wave Watch is my favorite show. You're not, Buzzy. We are. Watch Wave Watch. How is the waves out there at sunset? Pretty fun, yeah. How big is it out there? It's about 8 to 10. Um, we had some small waves all week, and it's pretty welcome to get some big surf again. Yeah, I was watching you grab a couple waves out there. It looks pretty fun. I can't wait to get out there. How's the water? Pretty cold. I see you got a pretty, pretty much wetsuit on here. Well, uh, I think the wind's colder than the water, but, you know, Hawaii's pretty nice. I just uh, wear a wetsuit so I can stay out longer. How long were you out? I was about two hours. Is that all? Yeah, well, I skip breakfast, and, you know, skinny Halley boy like me can't miss meals too much. Two hours? What? It's 12.30. You should have been out there for about four or five hours. Hey, Hans, I noticed your hair's dry. Hot news for uh, Mike Latronic, besides breaking up with his girlfriend. He's been, uh, hey, <laughs> he's been, uh, he's been doing some, uh, use that. he's been working on some footage on the movie North Shore. Maybe you want to talk about that. Well, uh, I did the movie North Shore last year, and it was a really great job. I mean, there's nothing really better to be you know, than getting paid to surf. I was a stunt double for the lead actor, Matt Adler. Uh, he's a fine actor and he's a pretty good surfer. However, they needed somebody that uh, if, if they got hurt in the surf, Matt could still act, right? So I was the guinea pig on some of the wipeout shots and most of the big wave surfing. I really enjoyed do, doing that movie. It was uh, quite a break for me. I made some good money and uh, probably get some good recognition from it. Um, what can I say? I got paid to surf and I love it. Thank you very much, Mike Latronic, for uh, thank you, Wave Watch. Mark, what's so special about Hawaii, you know, the, the, the essence of Hawaiian surfing, what does it mean to you? Well, to me now what it means is the fact that it's, there's no limits, you know, it's, you, you think that there's, a, there's always a, that this is it, this is the ultimate, there's a, 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 a final stop, like you think that when you're starting off and you're in the white water and you might think Velziland is going to be the ultimate, you know, and you're at Velziland and you're ready, you're thinking, boy, this is so challenging, I can't wait, I can move up to sunset, you know, and then you get to sunset and you kind of get that under control and you, you think the next step up is Waimea, then maybe a lot of people think that Waimea is the last stop, but that's, that's as far as you can go, but now that after I surfed Waimea, now I'm starting to surf the outer reefs, you know, and, and there's a whole frontier of, of waves that haven't been ridden and the capabilities of, of performance in big waves, and it's not even, you know, touched upon, so to me, the essence of it is that there's no limits here in Hawaii to in surfing is always going to keep you inspired and keep you young because you know there's so much more to still look forward to no matter you know how accomplished you become. If you grow up in Hawaii, it seems though that there's more to 
away than just riding waves. I mean, it seems like you, you see kids uh, body surfing when sometimes you might see them uh, going fishing with their dad or something. Is, is that a real factor in the, the lifestyle here? I mean, it's yeah. just the ocean itself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's we, we live in the ocean just as much as we live on land here, you know, and that's, and that's what, you know, makes surfing so much a part of Hawaii, you know, it's, they're synonymous. I and mean, you can't think of Hawaii and not think about surfing and vice versa. We're going to go and check a wave of Mark out right now and we'll be back to talk to Hans. And I'm really proud to have Wave Watch here in Hawaii. And when I'm not surfing Waimea, I'm watching Wave Watch. I want my Wave Watch. And I get everything I want. We watch Wave Watch. You better watch Wave Watch too. Yeah! They turn you on. With me here is Mike Stewart. I know you're trying to string a new maneuvers. Do you practice a lot of maneuvers before uh, competition, and then once you master them, go ahead and try and use it in competition. I think you, you want to tell us about your new maneuvers. Yeah, that's kind of the that's true about the new maneuvers. Um, as far as most competitions, I figure out which kind of uh, wave condition the event is going to be held in, and then practice accordingly. Uh, as far as new maneuvers, um, that's something that I try to develop on the sideline, and uh, once I do perfect them, I do bring them to competition. Maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, your different maneuvers you do practice or innovate. Um, I think the maneuvers that are progressive right now are uh, uh, aerial 360s, and that's forward. They're actually it's a forward aerial 180 and then uh, reverse um, aerial 360, and those are I think the the next generation of maneuvers, so to speak. I've seen you do a couple of uh, cutback uh, aerial 360s. Uh, those are pretty interesting. Yeah. How'd you figure that one out? Well, I, a lot of, you know, in bodyboarding, uh, things just kind of happen spontaneous. Um, and uh, you go into maneuver with some expectation and, and uh, something comes out of it, whether it's uh, good or bad. Or it's just, uh, it's always interesting and, and uh, innovative. Well, Mike, uh, the other day they opened up the Waimeo River mouth. It was uh, raining a lot and uh, looked like a pretty fun stationary wave out there. How, how was that riding? It's actually quite fun. Um, it might look not really that happening, but it's a lot of fun. What happens is as the water's rushing down the, the stream, it creates a, a mound underwater out of sand, and the water hitting that creates a turbulence, and the, it's actually a rideable face. And as a, the sand erodes, it moves up and down the stream, so it's kind of... It's not really a, a moving wave, but it moves in a really slow pace. Can you practice aerials and all these radical cutback maneuvers on it? Well, you can practice cutbacks and uh, spinners, uh, but it doesn't really have the, the pitching lip, so it's difficult to get any air or rollos or anything like that. Can you surf on it too? Yeah, you can surf on it too. I mean, stand up and actually do a cutback? Sure. That's great. Hey, Mike, you just got back from Brazil, what, and you won the contest up there. How, how is the talent in Rio de Janeiro? Well, I think the bodyboarding there is a lot more developed, or it's de developed a lot more quick than it has uh, in the United States. Um, as far as the women bodyboarders, uh, in my opinion, they're about three or four years ahead of everyone. They're really good down there. They have a, a good attitude. They have all the maneuvers uh, together, and they're just far more advanced than any of the um, women I've uh, seen bodyboarding. The guys are up there as well, and uh, they're going to definitely pose a major threat in the upcoming years. Let's talk a little bit about the Pipeline Master event. Um, how many years have you won that in a row? Well, I've won it the last two years, but I've won it a total of uh, four times out of the six years they've held it. The pipeline is such a such a wedge out there. These uh, you're able to kind of drop into this 
barrel a little bit later than the actual surfers do and get right in the pocket and turn in the barrel and ride in there for you know a couple of seconds come out do a uh, aerial El Rolo off the lip and cut back I mean it's so spectacular it's so exciting to see try tell us what it's about taking off on a 10-foot wave and pulling into a barrel well, I'd rather do it on a bodyboard than a surfboard. First of all, it's a lot softer, so you don't have to worry about the thing hitting you in the tube. And plus, you're holding on to it dropping in, so you don't have to worry about standing up. On a couple of those late drops, I wouldn't even dream of standing up. Um, as far as getting tube right at Pipeline, the only way that I could... There's actually no way that I could uh, describe that. You'd just have to go out there and try it. Um, it's the ultimate rush, period. Well, thank you very much, Mike Stewart. With us is a guy who's seen a lot of the pipeline on a lot of bigger days and a lot of it from the inside, Jonathan Dom. How's it, John? How you doing? I'm doing real good, Mark. You're right. It isn't one of your bigger days. It still looks like a little bit of fun, though. Hey, John, you've been able to uh, almost make a career out of surfing pipeline. It's one of the few spots where you can do that. Um, is, was it ever your aspiration, your goal, to be a, a professional surfer? Well, when I was younger, I wanted to be a pro surfer when I was in the contest circuit in Puerto Rico. but. Um, there wasn't much money in it at that time, so I gave that idea up a long time ago. And I just came to Hawaii basically to surf pipeline and have fun. You know, you're a flight attendant with United, which is, seems like the perfect job to, if you want to travel and surf. But, uh, so, but how much of your income comes from surfing? Well, I'd say a fourth of my income comes from surfing. I don't know, I'm just doing what I enjoy, and luckily it, it's paying off. Okay, everybody's heard of... You know, obviously Derek is considered the main man out there now, and, and there's a and Ronnie Burns, and, and you know before it was Jerry and Rory and, and Jackie, and you know you've been surfing all along this whole time. Who do you see as being guys that have really been um, under recognized for their pipeline skill? Well, I don't know. I, I always like Marvin Foster a lot. You know, Marvin was always really, really good out there, and I like Ronnie also because both those guys um, aren't just dropping in and getting tubed. Pipeline's a hot dog wave, you know, just on a larger scale. Hard bottom turns, you know, snapping it underneath the lip. Tom Carroll's really good out there in that aspect, too. And uh, doing cutbacks at the end of the wave, you know, all these guys can just drop in, hold an edge, get tubed. Um, anyone can do that, and anyone can get an incredible ride out there. But to surf in there day in and day out and do all these different maneuvers is essential, I think, to being a really good pipe surfer. Thanks a lot, John Dom. Uh, Mark Fu and John Dom from Pipeline. Back to you, Peter. how to surf, understands the ocean, enjoys life, and watches Wave Watch. So that's been a special show all the way from Hawaii. I'd like to thank Mark and Hans for being on the show, and uh, we'll be back with another great show next week. Aloha! <laughs>
This episode of Wave Watch, partially funded by Sean Collins Wave Track and by Ocean Pacific. <laughs>